Okay. Hello and uh, welcome everyone. I'm so happy to share uh, this screen with my colleague, Professor Shweta Agarwal. Shweta is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science here at IIT Madras. Sorry. And I'm Preeti Aghalayam in the Chemical Engineering Department at IIT Madras. And it's my immense pleasure to have this very nice conversation with uh, Shweta for you. Uh, please, audience, keep in mind that we have the chat box open. So if you have any questions uh, for uh, Shweta, you can please put it in the chat box and I will pick it up on my screen. And at the end of the session, most likely, uh, we will be taking questions. Um, a small, very brief introduction about Shweta. Um, Shweta joined the IIT Madras Computer Science Department in 2016. Is that correct, Shweta? 2016 is correct? Yes. Okay. Um, she joined us yes. in 20... Okay. Um, uh, she, and she did a PhD at U University of Texas, Austin before that, and also was a postdoctoral fellow in uh, California at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Shweta works in theoretical computer science. She's going to tell us what that means in terms that we'll all understand. Um, it's been very interesting because uh, she uh, tells me she's a cryptographer. And of course, I have a visual of all sorts of cool, funky things when I hear the word. And so very curious to know a little bit more about that. Um, it's also been a great honor, I think, for IIT Madras overall that uh, Shweta was conferred with the extremely prestigious Swarna Jayanti uh, Fellowship by uh, Department of Science and Technology a couple of years ago. So, which is why I put the title as Smida's Touch and so on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that journey also uh, later on in uh, today's session. So we have, a, I think, a reasonably sort of a chill set of uh, agenda items to talk through. And if you're OK with it, Shweta, I'd like you to start with maybe a little overview of your uh, research work, the work that you do in it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Preeti, for the introduction. And thanks for inviting me. Can you hear me OK? All right, so uh, I'm very happy to be here today. And I'd like to say that uh, to the audience that if there's any along the free to me and ask, or, you know, uh, let's try to keep it as, inter as interactive as possible. So uh, let me start with a, uh, you know, short overview, uh, just a, you know, very brief overview about my work. Uh, and uh, can you all see my slides? Yes, Shweta, I, I believe so. Good. So uh, I work in the area of cryptography, like Preeti said, and in particular in the area of post-quantum cryptography. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, uh, about post-quantum cryptography, challenges, opportunities, and beyond, like my slide, uh, slides say. So before talking about post-quantum cryptography, let me just try to uh, give you a brief idea about cryptography itself. And uh, as many of you may know, cryptography provides a guarantee that your information is secure. So the kind of guarantee that we provide is that breaking some kind of crypto system should be as hard as solving some difficult mathematical problem. So in more layman terms, for instance, let's say that uh, you're trying to do a purchase online and you have your credit card number and you're encrypting this. So you're, you know, put, putting some uh, code around it to keep it secure. And now you send it over the internet. You'd like to have a guarantee that nobody can snoop the internet and retrieve your credit card number uh, from that. So the kind of guarantee that cryptography gives is that, uh, let's say that there's an attacker that can, uh, in fact, get your credit card number. So, you know, this attacker, she can break open the code and retrieve the credit card number, then we guarantee, so cryptography guarantees, that there is also an attacker that can solve some very famous and difficult mathematical problem. So the proof, therefore, 
uh, is that since we don't expect this difficult mathematical problem to have a solution, therefore the attacker that breaks open the code and retrieves your credit card number cannot exist. So this is the way that we argue about uh, security, right? But now one very uh, important term here that I've glossed over is the term difficult. So when we say difficult, what does this mean? In particular, for whom should this problem be difficult? So as I already told you, the entire security rests on the hardness of this underlying mathematical problem. So this had better be hard, right? So, but for whom should it be hard? And this whom is generally represented or captured by the so-called cryptographic adversary which is normally modeled by a classical computer. And the typical guarantee is that unless the attacker can solve this uh, underlying hard problem, attacking and breaking open the code should take more than let's say the age of the universe in CPU cycles, all right? And this uh, sort of guarantee is really robust to the type of computer you use. So whether you use your mobile or your laptop or your soup or some supercomputer, the speed ups that these uh, uh, different types of devices offer, they, they are very well understood and quantifiable. So you can set the security of your crypto system accordingly. And in general, it will not matter how, you know, which type of device you use. It's, it's going to be secure against that. But this question becomes a lot more delicate if you change not the quantity of the resource that you're using to break the system, but the quality of the resource. So in particular, what happens if your attacker is not modeled by a classical computer, but rather a quantum computer? So this is the question that we'll uh, try to study. And let me tell you a little bit about quantum computers here. So quantum computers are fundamentally a new paradigm of computing, which use the laws of quantum physics rather than classical physics. All right, and in general, quantum computers are much more powerful than classical ones. And in particular, they can uh, allow very often exponential speed ups in solving a particular problem, right? And what's the worrisome thing for cryptography is that most of current day cryptography relies on the hardness of mathematical problems that are hard only for classical computers, but are actually easy for quantum computers, right? So all of our cryptography sort of goes out the door if the attacker is not classical, but is quantum. So this is, this is the problem. Now I've told you that, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a problem and all of cryptography is broken if we get quantum computers. So naturally the question that arises is, is this threat real? I mean, is this, is this something that we should be worried about or is this just something in theory that, you know, we're trying to study? And the short answer to this question is yes, this threat is very real. And in fact, uh, in, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of activity uh, in this area with you know, different companies uh, announcing that they've reached what's called quantum supremacy and so on. I won't get into the details of that, but uh, just suffice it to say that there are many companies and you know, governments that, uh, that have built quantum computers that can do important things. So this threat is real. And even before we had these companies, uh, you know, making new strides in the development of quantum computers, it was very well uh, understood that this is a very probable event that, you know, this is a real problem. So in particular, the National Institutes of uh, Institute of Standards and Technology has long since initiated a process to solicit, evaluate and standardize quantum resistant cryptography. So even before we had all these uh, new breakthroughs, it was already well understood that, you know, we need to do something about this. And there has been a lot of uh, global research in trying to secure our crypto systems against these quantum computers. So what about post quantum cryptography? Right. So well, I told you that cryptography is based on the hardness of certain mathematical problems. And post quantum cryptography similarly is based on the hardness of mathematical problems. But now these are problems 
for which quantum computers also offer no advantage. And in this uh, arena, the most promising problems, the most promising family of problems, I should say, are problems in what we call high dimensional lattices, right? So what's a lattice? Well, in layman terms, you know, lattices, it's just a periodic arrangement of points. So we've seen them everywhere. Beehives are a kind of lattice. Crystals are a kind of lattice. You know, all those beautiful tessellations in Islamic art, those are types of lattices. Mathematically, it's, you know, what you see here. It's a discrete uh, arrangement of points with a periodic structure. And here in this uh, toy example, I've just shown you a lattice in two dimensions. In practice, you will have, you know, a few hundred dimensions uh, in the lattice. And you have problems, you know, in this mathematical structure that we believe are hard even for quantum computers. So an example of a hard problem is the shortest vector problem. What is this problem? Let's say that I give you a lattice. I'm representing this by some basis vectors. The question I'm asking is, what is the shortest non-zero lattice point in this lattice, right? What is the shortest vector? And it turns out that this problem is very, very hard, both for classical and for quantum computers. So cryptography from lattices, I mean, this is a you know wide open uh, area. It's very young. It has lots of uh, exciting progress in recent times. And you know, many, many exciting things happen, happening as we speak. Uh, one of the basic things you can hope to do is you know, rebuild old cryptography. So things like uh, encryption schemes or digital signature schemes and so on that we already knew how to do from problems that are not quantum secure, those we can now try to do in a quantum secure way. But what's even more exciting and what my uh, research focuses on is that the mathematical structure of lattices is so expressive and sort of so powerful that not only can you redo stuff that you knew how to do you know, in the pre-quantum era, you can actually do new things that you had no idea how to do from any other mathematical structure. So you're getting sort of, you know, two for the price of one. You get post-quantum security and you get new functionality. Currently, this is at the cost of efficiency. Okay, so we have lots of applications like, you know, you can think of having secure elections where you encrypt your votes and there's an algorithm, a cryptographically secure algorithm that determines the winner um, and you know, maintains your individual vote privacy. You have ways of uh, you know, protecting IP. So let's say that you have some new algorithm which you would like to uh, sell, but you don't want anyone to figure out what the algorithm is. Well, you know, you could uh, sort of imagine a kind of magical object called an obfuscator in which you put in your algorithm or your code. And what comes out is something that works. It gives you the right output for a given input, but it is secure. So there's no way for you to figure out what is the algorithm sitting inside it, right? Then there's this very cool notion of uh, deniable encryption, which lets you do activism. So, you know, let's say that we're in the freedom struggle era and there's some sensitive message that, you know, we encrypted. Uh, and now let's say, you know, the, somebody from the British Raj comes and puts a gun on our head and says, open this message. Then cryptography gives you a way to cheat. It gives you a way to open the message in a fake way. So let's say that you encrypted something saying the election was rigged. If someone puts a gun to your head, you can open that cipher text to say, I, I like to cook. So it lets you deny what you encrypted. And there are, you know, many other applications. The final one that I leave you with is uh, something that I particularly work on, uh, computing on encrypted data. And uh, I'll uh, read out a short quote from, uh, uh, an article that appeared in Nature a few years back. It says, it talks about personalized medicine, right? So the dream for tomorrow's medicine is to understand the links between DNA and disease and to tailor therapies accordingly. 
but scientists have a problem which is how to keep genetic data and medical records secure because this is very sensitive information right so you need to keep it secure while still enabling the massive cloud based analysis that is needed to make meaningful associations so believe it or not cryptography actually provides you a solution to this problem so we know how to perform medical analysis on encrypted data at least in theory so these algorithms have a long way to go until practice but at least in theory we have ways to do it so that's uh, all i'd like to say that was uh, uh, you know it, i i think it was uh, very nicely pitched in the sense that even if you're not a computer scientist you got a good feel for uh, where uh, this is going and so on um if you don't mind shweta there's a couple of questions that we can take that is pertinent to what you yeah, presented sure sure um one of them uh, is asking about the status of uh, this type of con quantum computing in india uh, in particular um is it merely in the research labs like yours or is it beyond that so uh i think by and large even globally you know uh, we're just starting this uh, post quantum standardization process i shouldn't say starting but we're still in the initial stages uh in india it's true that we are kind of not that far along uh, there aren't that many people in fact i think that uh, work on this topic okay and also there's a question i don't know if it's easy to answer or not how's government funding in this type of uh, area in our it's country it's fantastic it's very good. is it okay yeah. okay that's great um i think yeah, so there's if, one if if the <laughs> questioner is a student and if your grades are good you know please uh, apply and uh, okay funding okay so it's something that is definitely in the government's obviously i mean yeah. looking at the applications it has to be in the yeah. government's uh, radar for uh, yeah. investing okay um there's one question i don't know if i'm even reading this correctly uh, but he wants to know uh, this gentleman wants to know example of uh, new crypto functionality using lattices if you can give one but also yeah, in lay person one... terms <laughs> not in technical terms yeah so actually the very last example that i provided computing on encrypted data the medical so what yeah. what you can yes so what you can do using lattices is that you know you encrypt uh, information let's say everybody's genomic data or medical records you encrypt that you put all this encrypted information you know on some kind of cloud server let's say and now the cloud server let's say you know some untrusted uh, company any company that uh, you don't trust which is all companies right so you, you put it on yeah you put it on the cloud and let the untrusted cloud perform computation so it's it's very very surprising if you think about it because what does encryption mean it means that meaningful information has been converted to junk right it should not be uh, semantically meaningful to anybody who reads it that that's the whole point but what we are saying is that yes it will look like noise but you can add and subtract on it and you can run complicated algorithms on it and end up with an encryption of the answer so you know if you are running some research algorithm on unencrypted data and you get some answer you can now run the same algorithm on encrypted Encry data and get the answer also in encrypted form and this is one of the main breakthroughs uh, that lattices allow us to do okay and so if i have the solution and i'm the original uh, maker of the code to crack it i can get i can extract out the use yeah you it. have you have so basically the the person with the key can open it and read it okay perfect sounds fantastic so there's a secret key i mean so i should have said that you know there's a secret key because otherwise uh, you know if if no one can open it it's not of much use right so 
No, I, I think that was clear little... because you have to build it on okay. a, uh, you know, known key. And that, that was clear. That right. Was right, right, right. Um, so, yeah, I'll take maybe some of the other questions later uh, because I want to get a little bit more into your head at this point of time, uh, if you don't mind. And sure. so, uh, first off, I want, to t want us to talk a little bit about your inspirations. Uh, you had mentioned a couple of names when we've talked about um, when we talked about this earlier, and also you talked about puzzles and stuff like that. It all sounded very interesting. So I, I just want to know um, a little bit about what inspires you, what puts you in this area. So, uh, in terms of inspiration, well, I should say that you know at this moment. Uh, one of the most active inspirations I have is my cryptographic community. It's it's just a wonderful community. The people are so creative, you know, they're so smart, they're so dedicated, they just love problems so much. The kind of work that comes out, you know, I read it and I go, wow. So it's just, uh, it's really a wonderful thing to be in this community and, you know, read all this wonderful work. And it really motivates me to also try and pitch in and try to do something interesting. So th there is that. Um, sort of in, in the past, in general, I've drawn inspiration from a wide array of uh, creative thinkers. Uh, of course, within scientists and within computer scientists and math, you know, there is, of course, Alan Turing. Uh, I strongly recommend, by the way, this comic book called uh, Logic Comics, uh, which kind of traces the history of mathematics, uh, you know, starting from Bertrand Russell up to Alan Turing, and it kind of ends at, you know, where computer science is born. So it's a really fascinating uh, thing to see how this field e even arises, you know, how, how it is a part of mathematics. And all these scientists, uh, Turing himself, of course, is, is a tremendous inspiration. And over time, I think that uh, the inspirations don't necessarily come only from the realm of scientists or computer scientists. So of course, within that, there are many, I think any Indian working in any mathematical area is very inspired by Srinivas Ramanujan, right? So he's uh, he's like this uh, phenomenon phenomenon that uh, happened. And uh, in women scientists, uh, there there's a, a woman called Emily Nother, and you know when I used to take algebra classes. Uh, we keep seeing the name like Nerther's ring and Nerther's theorem and so on and so so forth. And much later, I read about her life, and it's just uh, phenomenal. I mean, the kind of uh, discrimination she had to put up against, like the lectures were that she gave, were not even advertised under her name. They were advertised under a man's name, right? And you know. The, the sort of problems and struggles and discrimination that she encountered. And then you go back and look at her work. It's so foundational and sort of fantastic. So, you know, there is that. But more generally, I feel that uh, for a long time now, I've been, I, I'm inspired by any authentic creative thinking. So whether in the field of art or music and you know, even just people in day-to-day -day life, like uh, we had a cook yeah. and, uh, you know, one, so we'd given her our house keys and uh, she would come and cook and leave. Like she was completely trustworthy. And one day she had a cold mm -hmm. and I happened to come in when she was there. So usually I, I don't come in when she's there. I come much later. But I came in and, you know, she was in the kitchen wearing a mask. This is all like pre-COVID time. So just that integrity I found so inspiring that nobody is even around. And this mask is, all of us know how uncomfortable it is. Yeah. Right. So I think that uh, inspirations are everywhere. And I try to learn from all of them.
Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, maybe we'll note down some of your uh, recommendations of books, etc. Maybe we can do that later and put it on the sure. chat for uh, people to see. Um, I also wanted to talk about your love of puzzles, uh, because at least that's a shared sort of love, I think. So I, I'm very keen to hear about that. Was this from childhood or was it more uh, later in adulthood that you... Yeah, I like think it? that... Uh... As a kid, sure, I, I liked puzzles. I wasn't very focused. I used to like all kinds of things. But uh, puzzles is, is something which is really at the heart of cryptography. You know, right. it's really at the at the end of it, it just boils down to here's the question, here's the puzzle, and can you solve it? And this is what uh, I think drew me to this field right from the beginning. One is, you know, how surprising and paradoxical it is. And the second is uh, how it's, the questions are very easy to state. So in fact, I, uh, you know, I often tell this that the first time I took a course in cryptography is actually when I taught it as a professor. I never even took a course. I just started working on it. My advisor gave me a problem. And it was so easy to state. I mean, here are the tools. Here is the question. Go do what you can do. And it was so addictive, you know. Mm. So it's just, uh, it's exactly like a puzzle. I mean, somebody asks you, here, you, you open one of those puzzle books and you read a question. And that's all there is. You can start thinking about it. So this is something which I, I really love about this field. Yeah. So do you still look at that kind of puzzles now or are you too much into the real, um, you know, codes and crypto? I mean, I, I look at them uh, when I can, like people, my husband I and I uh, throw puzzles at each other. So, uh, yeah, it's recreational, but uh, I I don't think I was ever into it in a very serious way in the sense that, you know, how fast can I solve how many puzzles? Nothing sure, like that. Sure, it was yeah. just something that was enjoyable and something that's really at the heart of this particular field, which is very enjoyable. Makes it a lot of fun. So uh, next thing I want to talk about is, you know, you the applicate you showed us four applications today, and I'm yeah. sure there's more that you work on. Uh, it feels like they're being curated very, I mean, they've been chosen very uh, carefully. And to me, it felt like, you know, that's a big motivator for you that with your work, there's all these uh, good things that you can do. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, first of all, check if that is a correct impression and, you know, what really motivates you. And um, these are difficult problems, like you said, uh, also. So sort of what, uh, I guess, slightly different than the inspiration. Uh, this is more a day-to-day -day thing, what drives you. Yeah. So I think that, uh, yeah, there are certainly a lot of meaningful applications. But actually, I think that, you know, whether the applications are good or bad, this is not something that the science itself can guarantee. So I think that science and definitely cryptography is, is a kind of a tool which is wielded by, you know, human beings at the end of the day. So cryptography has also been misused. Uh, you know, like if you have encryption algorithms, you can also build in trapdoors into these encryption algorithms so that you can read what your clients are uh, sending. And I, I uh, don't wish to get into details, but uh, I think that uh, good stuff, of course, can happen, but so can bad stuff. I think that's just the nature of things. Uh, so applications, yes, I mean, I am motivated by the idea of post-quantum cryptography, especially in the Indian context, like being being somebody who understands it and can try to uh, sort of help in its development in the country. Uh, but I think that actually the real answer to what motivates me is just the question itself. So like I said, you know, the, the questions have such a puzzle-like and frankly addictive flavor that you sort of you it's hard to stop thinking about them so i think that it's not even so much that i'm uh, 
uh, motivated as much as i'm addicted like i i find <laughs> it hard to <laughs> i find it hard not to think so you know like there this question which i one of the applications i showed you of deniable encryption right mm. so just think of what what a crazy kind of a thing it is right so i'm encrypting something and i'm sending it to you and you should be encrypted correctly so but now i'm saying that if somebody puts a gun to my head and forces me to open the box i put inside it a rabbit but i pulled outside a turtle right this is what it's uh, guaranteeing so this is something which lately i've been working on and it's hard for me to stop thinking about this question so i think <laughs> yeah it's more an addiction than a motivation fantastic um, i'll go i'll switch gears a little bit at this point and go back maybe a, a decade and a half or so you grew up in uh, pune yeah. uh, and you know from a tight knit family and you studied your your college uh, studies were in pune and then there were all these uh, i don't know what Uh, adjective you want to use for the situations that happened in your life that led you to your phd at uh, texas and so on so can we talk a little bit about how your growing up was what you studied what was fun how you got into this yeah so uh, in my case actually all along uh, it's been really like a kind of a random walk where i go where my fancy takes me right and uh, as a, a child and as a student I, it's not that you know i was very focused on computer science or anything like that i would just try to read different things and you know i was into music i was trying to learn some instrument so you know just various things uh, that interested me uh, but at the time that i finished my college degree i started working at a job and i found the work to be uh, not very creative you know fairly repetitive and not really requiring any innovative thinking or uh, conceptual mm-hmm. leaps of any sort and in my spare time i would read a lot of uh, books uh, so for instance one of the books that uh, really had a big impact on me was this book called the fabric of the cosmos by brian green where you know he's describing well the fabric of the cosmos and i remember in one of the early chapters he writes really beautifully like explaining things at a level which you know a random college student can understand and uh, there in one of the early chapters he he describes the concept of space time and you know how how uh, it is warped and you know the the fact that the speed of light is a constant and so on and i remember being just so absolutely blown away by that that i felt that wherever and whoever are these people that are doing this kind of thing right who are engaging their minds in these kinds of sort of fantastically cool and like really challenging their minds like very innovative very imaginative wherever are these people whoever are these people i just want to go and try to learn so i knew really very little but uh, so it's it's actually quite a uh funny coincidence that i ended up in you know quantum or post quantum uh, something because my my journey towards my uh, higher studies was also triggered by uh, you know physics and this right. uh, this book and other other such books So, oh, um, Shweta, you're also an artist, uh, right? I'm. Uh, I. I little you bit. Dabble. Yeah. Dabble. Da- yeah, dabbler. You have less and less time for it in in this job, I'm sure. But um, I think it's gone down and mm. come up actually. Okay. 
yeah so i've been uh, trying to um, do more of it in the last Is couple of painting years. or what i know nothing about art i can assure you but what kind is it uh, it's a well i enjoy art of all kind what i do when i have time is oil painting okay yeah not so easy i don't think right canvases okay it's a lot like research actually this is so uh, easy or difficult as research yeah exactly i mean which is not easy so you sort of show up and hope that there is something that you are trying to say of course art allows you a lot more space like the language is uh, less rigid so you can or i shouldn't say rigid but less structured so you know you have more freedom so you you have something which you would like to express and you show up at the canvas and see where it goes so it's not like people ask you know how do you plan the painting and mm. you really don't you kind of see what happens you you just show up and see where it takes you you know i have often even in this uh, type of sessions that we've been having on this platform um try to talk about this misconception people have that you know you're either creative or you're an engineer right you know, or whatever a scientist whatever we would like to call ourselves and it, obviously it's not true in your in your case um it's probably not true in general right and and you know from what i have gleaned about how you used to be during growing up years even now your interests are fairly um very they contribute to each other right don't Absolutely. don't you think yeah So, absolutely and in fact the opposite misconception also exists so when i was a graduate student i used to also take a lot of art classes hmm. and at that time the you know fellow students in in my art classes would say that you know scientists are boring it's it's also hmm. uncreative and blah 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 and in in the scientific circles people would dismiss all of art saying that you know it's so subjective i mean look at this painting it's made by picasso it's just these uh, so many splashes of color anybody could have made it you know the whole thing can just be dismissed so at that time i was foolish enough to argue on both sides like i would keep having these arguments with everybody that on both sides right so uh neither is true i mean there are yeah. different aspects of the mind how can they be in conflict have yeah. to complete each other in some sense yeah and it's all within us so i mean as individuals it's what um exactly yeah and also this 24 hours in a day our lives are long so there is i i, I do think that there is opportunity and time for all this. so it, it's really it, it was very uh, definitely surprising but also very interesting to hear about uh, your uh, painting and so on so some day hopefully i'll get to see that as well the scene behind you is not yeah. done by you right the the no. the back <laughs> it's a bing it's a it's a bing wallpaper oh, okay, i okay. don't want them to see <laughs> Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's very important to mention that. Thank you, Bing, for a very beautiful background of scenery. Uh, I think, Shweta, we are at forty minutes, and I would really love to talk about your Swarna Jayanti. I've been looking at the website and trying to, you know, figure out how many women are there in this list, and I think I've counted like three in its history. And um, I know we've. we had a little chat about it you almost didn't go for the presentation yeah. so uh, you know how how was that experience was it really scary or were you super chill no, about it and, it wasn't scary at all it was uh, i mean when i look back at it uh, you know so let me recount in brief yeah, the please, story please. because yeah. that's interesting so it all started with a well meaning senior in my department suggesting i apply for it and i didn't know much about it but you know uh, here somebody i respect and like uh, asking me to apply so i applied and then uh, it turned out that uh, 
so I got shortlisted for the first round and it turned out that the interview date that they had for the first round was a day when I was to be flying back from France. So France to India. Just a moment. Nay. Uh, I was flying back from France to India and I was supposed to be on the flight when this interview was scheduled. So I thought, you know, well, I can't make it. This flight is already booked and moreover, it's been booked by my uh, host in France and, you know, changing it will cost money and I don't want to ask them and so on. So initially, I just wrote back saying that, you know, can we just do it on next day because it was a two day uh, thing. And they, they even agreed that, yeah, we can do it on Skype, we'll test it and so on. But it kept bothering me that, you know, fine, you know, maybe the chances that I get it are almost none. But uh, I've applied for something and it's just, it's just good practice to start, finish what you've started properly, right? So I said that, uh, you know, fine, I, I'm just going to go for this interview because I've been invited for it and I should go. So I did ask my host to change the flight date and uh, so on. So one day before the interview, I was flying uh, from France to Delhi, right? And because I had been in France that previous week, I didn't in fact have any time to work on my slides. So it's in the flight that, you know, I open my computer. I'm like, okay, I need to make slides for tomorrow. And uh, there's no power in my computer. So then I'm hunting for like a plug point in economy class. There's no plug point. Uh, then I requested some the air hostess to help me. And, you know, she was a bit sympathetic because by this time I was starting to get a bit anxious. So we found like one nice kind looking uncle and auntie in first class and you know i went to them and told them can you please charge my computer <laughs> so you know they're sitting there charging my computer and i was very embarrassed about it and then anyway so i got my computer i made the slides and i landed in delhi uh, sort of at night uh, the next morning was the presentation and my friend sarita was driving me to the venue so, you know, she's very confident about Delhi and mm -hmm. we're like, yeah, we're going to be there in 20 minutes. And we set out accordingly. And it turned out we just kept hitting roadblock after roadblock. And what was happening was that there was a marathon happening, which we didn't know about. And all the roads were closed. So we were very close to the venue. But because of the roadblocks, we couldn't actually get there. And all kinds of crazy things happened, but to cut a long story short, we finally reached there two hours late. So my slot, my slot was gone. I had no idea if I can do this presentation now. And I told my friend to wait for me downstairs while I check upstairs whether they'll even take me in now, right? As it turned out, they did. So as soon as I got there, they said, sure, you know, you can go. And, uh, so, you know, with all of this madness of sort of this late night international flight and the slides and, you know, then this uh, traffic, marathon. yeah, this marathon and not getting there, suddenly I found myself in this room, right? And you have these eminent scientists from all over the country sitting in front of you. And what hit me at that moment was what an honor it is. You know, yeah. here are these wonderful scientists across all engineering disciplines and they actually want to hear what i have to say how wonderful that is right so i was just full of enthusiasm i mean i gave my presentation i wanted them to ask me questions and i remember like when they asked me to leave i was like i was resisting i was like no don't don't send me away <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> ask me, ask me more things. Tell me what you think about what I'm saying. And of course, they had better things to do <laughs> way. But uh, it was, yeah, that, that is how it was. And for me, I, I never thought uh, it was the first time I had applied. And I just went away with the feeling of gratitude that 
I had this chance to engage with some of the most well-known scientists in the country. And I was just very happy that I had that opportunity. So it was uh, really uh, very eventful experience. The final feeling that I had was one of it being a real honor to have talked to all these people. Yeah, and I think it's really impressive, uh, Shweta, that of course, being a, a woman minority, I, I think we'll claim that this is an honor for all of us also. Um, but also, it was the first time, right? Usually, people apply once, use that experience, and because the nomination for Swarna Jayanti stays for, I think, uh, two, three years, you know, you get used to the experience, and next time you go into the interview a little better prepared with more publications under your belt and so on. And most of the people that have been successful, um, as far as I know, that's what they have said. So I, I think it's amazing that, you know, in the first instance, with all these um, issues about making it, that uh, you, they must have found it really impressive to award it then and there. So, well. <laughs> I'd, I mean, I'm grateful for it. That's all I can say. And I'm very grateful to all the people that have uh, contributed, right? Especially my family, my husband and my two mothers have played a very, very big role in particular. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just grateful that it worked out so nicely. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's very, very really, very nice to hear. Um, I want to talk about, you know, that feeling when you entered the room. I'm sure that there were countable, like countable on one hand type of number of women in that room. And I'm sure that in most of the fora, even today in 2021, you're a, a minority as a woman in um, computer science. So, I mean, not so much about us, you or me or whatever, but for the future generations, do you have any... I don't know, like suggestions or something to prop them up or something in navigating this uh, type of space. Well, I think that uh, you should be bold. You know, this is what I I learned uh, in my own way through my own experiences that it is indeed true that uh, being you know the the super minority like we know the numbers how bad they are so you know only 12 percent women are faculty at the dean level or director level the number is almost zero um and uh, i think that the 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 attitude that people have uh, in society is definitely not an encouraging one it's it's it tries to put you down you know it tries to put you down at various uh, steps at various stages um, and uh, well i don't know if i i call it advice but what worked for me at least so far is that uh, i don't really listen to anybody i mean i <laughs> I, I mean i listen but you know i I consider everybody's uh, opinions. I mean, even there, I'm very selective about whose opinions I'm considering. And then I do what makes sense to me and I'm willing to take the consequences of that. Like maybe it's not going to work out. Like maybe the negative things that people are saying are going to be true, but I'm okay with that. I'm going to take the responsibility for that. So I think that uh, I would really like to this is also what I tell my students and I would like mm. to tell all women students and sort of young ca career women that uh, there's no need to fit any kind of template. There's no need, you know, to be a certain kind of person that, uh, you know, people expect you to be. Follow your own inner voice and it's fine you know let's just be bold and take the consequences that come and it's not always uh, easy i think that you know there are studies that have shown for instance there's a uh, study that uh, uh, shows that you know if you show a picture 
with people sitting around the table and there's a clearly marked head of the table like there's a chair which clearly looks like the head mm. of the meeting right if you show the picture with a man sitting in that chair then 100 out of 100 people say that he's the leader mm. and he's the leader of the meeting he's the head of the meeting and if you show the same picture but with a woman sitting in the chair then 50% people will point to the man next to her and say he's the leader of the meeting so people really don't see us as leaders you know but i think it's their ignorance and we should learn to see ourselves as leaders that really is the key thing so don't let this negative outer voice ever affect your inner voice that's what i would say that's really very nice actually comments uh, they're not asking me questions per se but they are mentioning where they are from and lot of them are from uh, women's college uh, in tanjavur I, i read and and several other places like that and they're from the computer science department so i i think that's it, it's very good to hear this from you and i particularly liked what you said about there's no need for us to fit into any yeah. template um you know that uh, whatever society has uh, made and society or even your own you know family. Uh, not family society workplace you know everywhere i think that in some environments now it it's accepted that the woman is a part of the group but if she airs opinions that are different from you know the customary opinions that are being aired then people find it really really hard to stomach uh, so i think that seeing a woman really as a leader this is something which uh, i personally see that there is a lot of resistance to that yeah no definitely i mean, I mean things are changing i believe yeah, but uh, sometimes it's 2021 and the rate of change is kind of really um, yeah. it should feels like it should be better but that's okay i mean we'll stay in it and um that's one of the reasons we wanted to have these uh, have this series as well because these are just our real stories and yeah. you know really it was a fantastic uh, set of things we heard from you spanning a lot of little bit of your personal life and uh, so on and you know your studies and also the research work that you do um i am going to try to keep to our uh, one hour deadline so i have maybe three or four questions uh, for sure. you very short ones one i'm just just a curiosity one because i haven't asked you this before also what is your group composition in terms of men uh, and women your research scholars and postdocs and so on so right now um, let me think it's exactly 50-50 right okay now. okay yeah yeah and and i think change starts in in that way um, hopefully yeah. yeah yeah like in my I group i have very few uh, women empiric... right <laughs> chemical engineering yeah i see, I see. go But ahead I you think, were saying uh, i've seen just that you know empirically i see that uh, women faculty often get more women students than men faculty like other colleagues of ours like uh, right like sheetal or deepa yeah i i see that they also get uh, more women students i also have had more women students than my male colleagues okay so i do think that matters as well i see but i i, I like that it's 50 50 it's uh, which yeah. is uh, which helps i think keep the uh, group environment very right. uh, more stable as well okay so what i'm going to do now is sort of like a rapid fire or uh, just three questions rapid fire sure. okay so uh, we've gone through this really difficult year and we looks like we're still going through it what's your preference this online lectures or are you just wanting to have the students come back the, to campus or the latter <laughs> i don't them? even need you to finish the question <laughs> i i hate online uh, yeah. i want i want to see people in flesh and blood so students if you're listening to this please understand that just as much as you want to come back we want you back as well uh, so you're stranded in a desert island shweta i'll allow you to take three things with you what would you take can i take my husband and dog 
okay two will grant you and what's there i'm really curious about what's this third one she is going to say paint brush or something no, like that it's it's a book but i won't tell you which one <laughs> Okay, so some books is okay. That's I thought you'd say paints. I want three colors at least, and I need my laptop because I have this, you know, this problem. The laptop, I'm addicted the, to. No, I don't need the laptop for that, right? Oh. So the laptop is needed only to write the paper. So this is a, a good as well as bad thing about theory. Like when I wake up, the first thing that comes to my mind is maybe I can change this. in this you know you can just work in your head so this is a good and bad thing about theory and a laptop is the thing that tops the list of stuff i don't want don't. on this island <laughs> so then we should we as the audience and me should be grateful you didn't put any equations in your slides at the beginning right <laughs> because you probably write a lot of okay thank you so much for not putting any equations <laughs> Okay now uh, you know what Mysore Pak is right Mysore Pak yes okay. yes Shrikhand versus Mysore Pak <laughs> what do you think uh, well i grew up in maharashtra shrikhand shrikhand okay fantastic <laughs> so on that very sweet note uh, i think we will wind this up thank you so much uh, shweta for just you know coming on board and sharing your story it was really lovely the audience have loved it too and lots of uh, um, positive comments are there <laughs> we did manage to take a few questions from them uh, and we'll try and put your book recommendations etc in the chat which will stay for a little bit sure. so we'll say good night with uh, maybe one final thanks to shri balaji for uh, uh, supporting us uh, on the tech part of it and to nptel and uh, uh, society of women engineers um, chennai uh, in particular in india in general and also the iit madras alumni association uh, i think last note please join our uh, society of women engineers chapter uh, if you are an iitm uh, faculty student alumnus etc so that's I all from i would also share that please yeah I'd also like to add a thanks to you, Preeti, for you know taking this initiative and uh, putting together this very nice series. Thank you, thank you, Shweta. We'll be back soon. So, Shrikant time now. So, bye and good night, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye.